Um, I'm now going to introduce our speaker. So our speaker this month is, and I apologize if I don't get the pronunciation quite right, but uh, correct me, but I'm going to do my best. Um, so our speaker, actually, why don't you just tell us your name? You know, I don't want to do that thing where I'm angry. <laughs> yeah, so I know it's not easy. My name is Asedwa. I'm so yeah. glad I asked. I knew I was probably saying it wrong. <laughs> Isedwa. Um, and how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Oriba Bor. Oriba Bor, yes. Yeah. Okay, so our speaker this month is Isedwa Oriba Bor. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. So Isedwa, um, she's Access Now's you is uh, she's Access Now's U.S. policy analyst, also covering uh, business and human rights. Uh, she works to promote human rights in the digital age, focusing on the responsibility of the tech sector to respect human rights. She received her JD from Fordham Law School in New York City, as well as an LLM in international business law from uh, Universidad Pontifica Comillas, which I'm sure I also mangled in Madrid. Um, so. Isidu is going to be talking to us about a very current topic that we hear a lot about in the news um, <clears throat> that I thought, especially given the conversations around police justice and accountability and reform going on right now, would make for an excellent topic to discuss, um, specifically um, the technology of facial recognition. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about this technology. Um, both people who have lionized all the amazing things it can do but another conversation, one which we at EFF Austin and EFF have also been tracking and following about many of the cons civil liberties concerns around this technology as it regards ubiquitous surveillance, right to privacy, et cetera, um, and just ways that we can incorporate a technology like this that has the massive potential for abuse into our society in a way that safeguards our rights. And one of the main places that uh, facial recognition um, presents potential risks is um, actually in discrimination um, because there have been repeated studies that have been done that show that it turns out facial recognition is most accurate for uh, white men like myself. Um, if you are a woman, if you are a person of color, the accuracy drops significantly. And this is not just some hypothetical concern. We've even started to have cases now of people of color who have been wrongfully arrested because the facial recognition system misidentified them. And uh, slightly more comically, but you know, still I find very on nose with symbolism. We've even had uh, certain members of Congress, when their pictures have been fed into facial recognition systems, have been flagged as known criminals with arrest warrants. I'm sure that was just a mistake of the system. <laughs> but so Isadua is going to basically, um, you know, kind of lead us in a discussion of this technology, and hopefully we will all gain a better understanding of the potential risks of this emerging technology and how we can be sure that it is equitable and hopefully does not bake in existing worldly discriminations in the ways it is designed under a veneer of computer impartiality. So uh, without further ado, uh, take it away, Isidu. I mean to myself, it's, it's always a mute, unmute thing, but yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin and everyone for listening to me across your amazing today. And I think it's just amazing that this happens to be, that it's like to talk about facial recognition right when it's uh, something that is really important to your group here. So hopefully this conversation will be really interesting and helpful to everyone here. Um, and I'm hoping this will be more of a, a conversation rather than me just talking here endlessly. So please feel free to jump in with questions and comments. I think there isn't a chat function uh, apparently no, there is not, yeah. but, but I will also say that if you don't feel comfortable raising your hand, um, feel free to at the EFF Austin Twitter account. I will be monitoring it. And if you have a question there, I will feed your question along. Great. So, yeah, so hopefully we'll just we'll keep this um, as interactive as possible, but I can just start with giving a bit of background about uh, myself and about Access Now and the work that we do before we dive more into uh, specifically facial recognition. So Access Now is a global or digital rights organization that works at, at the intersection of technology and human rights. Uh, so lots of the issues that Kevin has mentioned earlier of encryption, uh, surveillance, so forth, we work on issues like that uh, from a human rights perspective. Um, so we're sort of organized with, a, we have a policy team, which is a team that I sit on, um, an advocacy team, uh, a digital security helpline, which is actually how the organization began as 
as the helpline, um, as well as a team that is focused on our annual conference, RightsCon. Um, we also have like a really a growing legal presence as well, which I'll talk about later. Uh, but basically what we do is sort of advocate for human rights in a digital age um, for things, uh, rights mainly focused around um, access to the internet and access to information, freedom of expression um, and privacy. So those are sort of the main buckets of rights that we work in. Um, and we see that the facial recognition uh, conversation sort of crosses a lot of those buckets that we usually work in, which is why it's been a really big part of the work that we do over the last few years um, and growing more so over uh, recent months and years. Um, you're right. So like Kevin said in, uh, in the bio part, I do, I work on uh, business and human rights. So uh, our engagement with companies, I generally lead on that as well as doing more specific US policy work. Um, but because our team is, is pretty international, I think our, our US policy team is only two people, two and a half people. Um, so we have, so yeah, so we're based in basically um, every region except Antarctica. Um, and I think our regional focus really helps sort of sharpen our perspectives on these issues. And when we get more into the conversation on facial recognition, I will, talk, I will touch a bit on um, some of my colleagues in other regions and what they're doing on facial recognition. So just to get a, a picture of what this looks like globally. Uh, so, yeah, so I just will start with a little bit of background about what face recognition technology is, um, and then we'll talk about some examples of how it's being used, the human and civil rights implications of that use, um, what the current landscape looks like um, around face recognition, and then um, recommendations or the responsibilities both for governments and for companies. Uh, so I'll start with a little bit of a definition and um, dive in a bit more into what facial recognition is and what it does. So, yeah, I guess a lot of you probably already know, but facial recognition um, generally encompasses um, four specific tasks, which include um, verification, identification, and categorization. So the first thing is a detection, whether there is a face. So it's a tool or system that would detect if there is a face um, based on a picture or whatever the, uh, the view is at the moment. Um, and it and then it goes into analysis, so to analyze the characteristics of that face. Um, and then the part when we talk about face recognition that we usually are focused on is the verification and the identification part of it. So the verification is um, sort of like a one to one match. So basically the system, the tool will be able to tell you whether um, based on an ID um, and other information that's already been presented, whether this face matches that ID. Um, whereas, for um, whereas for identification, it's more of like a one, one to many. Uh, so a face, is, a face is presented in the picture and it can tell um, based on a database of other faces and connects one picture to a database. So um, yeah, I mean, all this like, technical stuff is only interesting because it sort of helps understand the policy implications. Uh, another aspect of that would be the match thresholds. So when does um, when the systems are being used, they have it, it doesn't it doesn't give you like a yes or no. So you don't just like have a have um, a fish recognition tool that will tell you yes this is this person or no this is not this person. What it will usually do is to give you a score based on whatever parameters the creators of the of the system have set. Um, and then also the people who are using the system as well. So those are called like the match scores and the match thresholds. And basically from one tool to another, it could vary, but essentially what it does is give you um, a number, it spits out a number that tells how likely it is to be whatever face or, or um, person that you're looking for. Um, and so the, 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 match, the match thresholds matter because if you set, so the, the people using the tool can set like basically like, let's say we want anything, I want to see matches over like 50. And so that affects the, um, the rates of false positives or negatives you might get based on if you set your threshold too high or too low. Um, yeah, so I so said that's more, that's more interesting again, as it goes to the um, policy implications, which we'll see with uh, the human rights and civil rights harms later. But that's just basically like a quick, very, very quick overview of what we mean when we're talking about facial recognition and how it works. So the more um, interesting part is how it's being used. Um, I think just starting with starting with COVID right now, it's a really good example of 
how technology is often like the first um, the, the solution for every problem we can think of, whether or not it should be the best way to uh, attack the problem. So, for instance, during the COVID crisis, we've been tracking um, governments around the world that are turning to facial recognition as a way to respond to the crisis. So, um, one way is to, is to track compliance with curfew and quarantine. So, we've seen like in Russia and in India, for instance, um, the governments there have started using facial recognition to check if um, people are wearing masks, if people are breaking curfew or quarantine, uh, which you can imagine all the dangers that come with that. Come with that. Um, it, was, it has also been used to track or identify potentially sick people. So there are companies like um, Dermalog and Talpo um, that have adapted their tech to be able to sense temperature. Um, and in some airports around the world, they're adapting uh, whatever tools already are there to include um, uh, thermal reading um, as well as facial recognition. So basically, when you go through an airport, they can, they supposedly they can tell uh, whether you, or not you have COVID uh, through these tools. Um, another way that we're seeing it being used is you right as alternatives to um, other methods like fingerprinting. So, for instance, in here in New York, um, where I'm usually based in New York, the NYPD had been using fingerprinting at, the, at their headquarters for people to get in and out of the building. But because of COVID and concerns with you know, spreading the disease, they stopped using fingerprinting and now turned to um, some forms of facial recognition to do that instead. Um, and finally, another way we see that is with contact tracing. So um, I'm sure that all of you have heard of the very lovely company Clearview AI and all the trouble that they got into this year. And they were apparently in talks with the US government. So after this like huge scandal of Clearview scraping the internet for people's pictures and information and puts in basically everyone in their database um, and the fallout that came from that, they were reportedly in talks with the US government to provide some sort of like contact tracing solution, which when you think about like who do you want to be the one that has information on your your, your health data information as well as like every sort of form of picture there is of you, like Clearview is not necessarily the person you think of or the company that you think of that would be best for that. So yeah, so just the uh, the COVID crisis, I think, has really made it kind of evident how facial recognition technologies can be used. And another big thing this year that's made that very clear is the, uh, the BLM protests that have been happening. Um, so, you know, in the US, we are very protective of our First Amendment rights. So you don't necessarily assume that when you go out into um, into the public to go to a protest that you will be tracked with a tool that's not just a security camera, but able to detect a face within a crowd of you know hundreds or thousands of people. Um, and the the protests have given new attention to uh, the use of facial recognition, specifically by law enforcement. And you know, Kevin mentioned earlier that. Uh, there have been already reports of people being falsely arrested because of facial recognition. And some of that comes from um, how people have been tracked uh, through protests, which as we go later into the human rights and the civil rights that are implicated by that, it's very obvious that people's rights to peacefully protest should not be impeded um, with the concerns of um, uh, invasive surveillance technologies being used in public spaces. Uh, Right, so we also see, right, so um, law enforcement use is probably among the most, uh, the most egregious forms of it because the risks there are to your life and liberty. But it's also being used for commercial reasons um, and in, in the private sector. So, for instance, in some housing complexes, even here in New York City, um, facial recognition had been employed as a way to let people in and out of their buildings. And this is particularly worrisome when it's, because this specific example was a building um, in Brooklyn in an area with a high minority population. And again, as Kevin mentioned earlier, this is a technology that is it's fantastically terrible at generally um, recognizing faces of um, people of color and of women. So we see that being, we've seen it being used uh, for things like housing and employment as well, um, for hiring practices as a way to screen applicants. Um, and, but then, but then there are also some supposedly were some, some benign or even beneficial uses of facial recognition, which is why the companies, governments usually would want to push it is that there are 
but it can be positive to this. So one example is the Facebook tool that allows um, people with disabilities who are visually impaired um, to be able to basically understand um, and, and go through pictures and uh, visual content on Facebook uh, through a facial recognition tool. So that's one of the one of the and and, and also in areas uh, such as um, fighting uh, child pornography and, and exploitation, um, it's been used as a way to uh, as a way to stem those practices. So although like there are some of those beneficial uses of facial recognition, I think the important conversation for us to have is what the risks are to our human and civil rights. So right off the bat, it's very clear that our privacy um, is at risk when you can't go to a protest without uh, worrying about uh, facial recognition technology and tool being used to surveil you. Um, particularly for the US, because we don't have a comprehensive data protection law, uh, when, even, even when this, even when this um, system is being used in the most ideal of circumstances, so when it's perfectly accurate, uh, when it's, yeah, it's, it doesn't discriminate, even when it's being used in that way, there is still the danger of the information that one company or agency or whoever it is that's holding this information when they suffer a data breach. And again, because we don't have a comprehensive um, federal data protection law in the US, the risks to that are grave when people's rights to privacy are compromised because there's essentially not much remedy. Um, in addition to that, there's also right the, when it comes specifically when it comes to um, to law enforcement and police use of facial recognition, uh, the risk of exacerbating already um, discriminatory practices because we find that these tools are often being used in already over policed uh, neighborhoods and communities, which are generally communities of color. So when a tool that again is more likely to misidentify a person of color, it's being used in a community of color, we can imagine um, the, the dangers of that are exacerbated. And that's why, again, when it is, there's no, there's no perfect scenario that will reduce that risk. So companies would try to say, well, well we can make this tool as accurate as possible. And even within the last four years, I would say companies like Amazon and Microsoft have made their tech, their, their facial recognition tools much more accurate. Um, the example that Kevin was talking about earlier of uh, members of Congress being misidentified with, I think it was, I think it was Microsoft's tool that an ACLU ran that um, little study or experiment. I think after that came out, like Microsoft, IBM, the others, like in, exponentially improves the ability of their tool to recognize um, female faces and then also faces of color. But that doesn't mean so, but but just because it becomes more accurate doesn't mean that it actually ends up um, removing discrimination from the picture. So the underlying issue is that it is a, and ends up becoming where are these tools being used, particularly when it's being used by law enforcement. So is a police department more likely to use facial recognition in like a poor neighborhood in Brooklyn than they are on the Upper East Side in Manhattan? And so if that's the case, it doesn't matter if it's. 100% accurate at recognizing every kind of face because it just again continues to perpetuate and um, the discriminatory practices that already existed. Um, so the the current landscape right now uh, is is a bit of a, a mixed bag, but but still kind of a good time for these conversations to happen um, because of the protests and because of other advocacy by civil civil rights organizations and other groups. We've seen some really important moves on facial recognition in the last like few weeks and months. Uh, even just today, the Court of Appeals in the UK uh, ruled on a facial recognition case, essentially saying that the police department there were improper in their use of facial recognition in a public space. That has like there are other implications in that ruling, but just to get um, a, a, a high court in Europe making such a decision is a really big deal. Um, and most notably, I'm sure that. Uh, some of you saw the um, announcements by Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon um, about a month or so ago, uh, saying that they would either stop or put a moratorium on sale of their technology to law enforcement. And those, so those, um, those announcements were really, they were they were great, particularly for Amazon. They're they're a company that I said that in in my work, we um, lots of what I do is trying to engage with companies and. 
to the credits, we, we've talked with Microsoft, we've talked with IBM, Amazon will never respond to you in anything. Um, and so to see um, a company like Amazon actually make such a concession was a really big deal. Ultimately, it doesn't really mean much because uh, just because they're not selling to uh, police departments that doesn't um, address use by ICE, for instance, or to other or other governments outside the U.S. Um, so it's while it's positive to get these statements from yeah from Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, there's still lots of questions to be asked, um, particularly when the statements are calling for a one-year pause or moratorium and asking uh, the U.S. governments and lawmakers to come up with laws to regulate um, the, the use of this technology. Uh, we have to keep in mind that at the end of the day, like these companies still have a stake in being able to use this technology. So that's why we'll see a company like Microsoft who can make very, you know, really appealing and commendable public statements and commitments about how they won't use this or they won't sell this. And then at the same time, support legislation on the states and local level um, or, or try to kill legislation on the states and local level that would try to hold them accountable. So a lot of what we're doing now is trying to, um, yeah, to hold these companies accountable and ensure that their public statements, sorry, that their public statements match with their um, their private lobbying and activity as well. Um, so uh, right, and then also, particularly in the U.S., some of the more exciting things we've seen happen around facial recognition has been very much around the state and local level. On the federal level, I think there was a bill that was proposed very recently. It's not going anywhere because of the current administration we're under. Um, but on state and local levels in, Cal in California, uh, Kevin mentioned San Francisco and Oakland. Uh, I think also in as well in Massachusetts, Maine. There have been places all over the country where um, there are there uh, the local governments are imposing bans on government and law enforcement use of this technology, which is really surprising and exciting. And I would just say that for a part. Basically, our um, from Access Now, our stance is that any use of facial recognition that can be used for mass surveillance should be totally banned. So, enabling mass surveillance is not anything that any government should be involved in. Um, and it's really not far fetched. Like, you, know, you think of mass surveillance, you can think of um, the Uyghurs in the in northwestern region of China and the sort of mass surveillance they're under. And you think nothing like that could ever happen here in the US. And yet, what we don't often pay enough attention to is the fact that. There's often there's already a lot of the infrastructure that would be necessary to make that happen. So in cities and uh, locations where there's already extensive uh, video camera surveillance um, capabilities, it's just one step away to um, to outfit those uh, those technologies with facial recognition, and we'll find ourselves under more of an of a mass surveillance uh, situation. So one thing we're really pushing for is. Any use of facial recognition that could lead to mass surveillance should be totally abandoned. Com and companies, governments have no um, have no reason whatsoever to turn to that as a solution. Um, and then besides that, um, I think among civil society, not just in the U.S. but even internationally, with with the partners we've worked with, there's maybe not necessarily um, agreements, but generally there seems to be a feeling towards a sort of ban or at least a moratorium. Um, on police use of facial recognition. Uh, again, so, because, oh, yeah. Hey, sorry, I was trying to get your attention without interrupting, and uh, I had promised you that uh, I would throw a softball, but it's not happening because uh, I had a better question. Uh, so it seems like, you know, companies like Amazon and Facebook, they, they, they seem to respond in, in a moment where the whole country is sort of engaged. Um, and uh, the whole country, at least in the U.S., seems to engage mostly on like questions of freedom, you know, like my right to say what I want, to do what I want, you know, within reason. Um, even, you know, in the face of a public health crisis, people really latch on to that idea. Um, but with privacy, it seems like so important in the U.S., whereas in other countries, uh, particularly in Europe, they seem to really prioritize it. Um, yeah. So I, I was wondering, it's like sort of a two prong question. It's a little bit of a wishy washy one, too. But like, why do you think that privacy doesn't seem to be as interesting to the average American where uh, those other issues of freedom do do grab attention? And uh, do you see a way to sort of attach privacy rights 
to those uh, more palatable rights as a way to push forward privacy agendas and uh, anti-algorithm um, or facial recognition software and that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, thanks for that softball, Alex. Why don't we just dive right into it? You're welcome. <laughs> it, um, right. So I mentioned that one one thing that gives the organization, I think, some a unique perspective is the fact that we work across um, across the globe. So the other members of my team who work really closely with me on facial recognition are based in Brussels. And it's really fascinating to hear the conversations we have about what's possible on the EU level versus in, in the US level. And I think Alex, you're absolutely right that um, here in the US, it's freedom of speech is, is a bigger and much more palatable uh, right for us to focus on than for privacy. And I would, um, personally, I think it's because the dangers of um, of the infringements in your rights to privacy are just maybe not quite as obvious. Um, and that we, as a capitalist society, have a lot of uh, trust in companies, right? So you say, we, we know that you, you don't get anything for free, so you understand, yes, maybe they will uh, collect some information about me, but at the end of the day, they're doing me a service. So we have sort of like an implicit trust in companies, even when it seems like we don't. Um, and I think that really contributes to it. So um, just, a, a, just a greater understanding of what the risks actually are. Well, so for instance, when there's a big data breach, everyone is really upset about it for like two minutes. And then unless you see something actually change about your personal life, then you just sort of go on, uh, go on as it is. Maybe you change a couple of passwords here and there, but there isn't as much outcry about that as there is for something, you know, relating to expression or, or speech. Um, and again, I also think that's because we've come to a place where we uh, trust companies with our personal information. Like you don't think twice about um, all the all the information that you're giving out uh, to a company when you sign up for an app or a service. Um, a good example of this that I just noticed recently actually was with TikTok. I was looking at TikTok's uh, privacy policy, and they actually have at least they have four privacy policies. One policy applies. To <laughs> yeah. One policy applies to users in the US, another one to users in Europe, another one to users in the rest of the world, and then there's one specifically for like underage children. And just looking at the policies for users in the US versus Europe, you see again just like how much more information TikTok is able to collect about you because you're based in the US and then because you're based in Europe. Um, and it's something that we don't like we don't really have a choice um, for most of the part, right? So it's not like you can read a hundred page privacy policy statements and your only options at the end are yes or no in order to get the service. So I think we have, there's very much like a reliance on companies and just sort of an acceptance of this is how it is if we want to get the services that we want. And then as to having, finding a way to make privacy a bit more palatable, I think it just has to be like public awareness to help people understand just how invasive the technologies are. So. Um, again, that it's not just a video camera watching, um, just, a, just not just a regular surveillance camera out in the streets, but a camera that can track you from one location to another, um, collects information about you from a bunch of different sites and so forth. Um, and I think that the protests and what's been happening over the last few months is probably helping a bit with that. So like the, the level of outcry has, certainly hasn't reached other things, but just the fact that a company like Amazon would respond to what's going on shows that they that they're aware that people are taking privacy maybe a bit more seriously um, than they would have otherwise. So, yeah, I don't really have a good answer on how to make us here care more about privacy, except for the more our privacy is violated and the more we see that we don't have uh, as many rights as we thought we did, that maybe that'll wake people up to the to the dangers of that. Um, and actually on the Amazon piece, that sort of um, brings me to another point again about why the Amazon um, move was really significant because just a month before Amazon announced that they would stop um, the, the, the stop uh, sale of fish recognition to, to police and law enforcement in the US, a group of shareholders that I work uh, very closely with had a proposal on, at the annual general meeting that was exactly about that. And of course, like Amazon voted it down. So the exact same thing, they don't listen to civil society, they don't listen to NGOs, they don't listen to their shareholders, but they did listen to the protests and the public outcry that happened um, around the beginning of June. So I think that gives a little bit of hope that 
hopefully if if Amazon listens and other companies listen as well, as long as we have um, a unified message that we're presenting to them. Um, Sarah, in sorry, I, I I know you had you wanted it to be a discussion. Uh, just tell me if you want right. me to shut up at any point. Um, I won't take it personally. Um, so I, I assume, and I could be totally wrong, that you have more uh, experience with uh, perhaps FOIA requests of the types of data that various agencies um, are collecting from, you know, Facebook, Amazon, whoever. Um, to what extent is that data available to you for like a public figure, for example, right? Like is is demonstrating the amount of insight you can get into a into a politician's life like a viable way forward or are there too many roadblocks yeah so actually i haven't done a lot of our FOIA requests but from my colleagues in the legal team i think that that's it hasn't been quite as um as much of a smoking gun as we would expect uh just by virtue of how long it takes to actually get a response on something um so i don't know that FOIA requests have been very good at least not for us in that way uh, one thing that we do that we do focus on though is on transparency reports. Um, so we advocate very strongly for companies or tech companies to release reports that show uh, government's requests for user data and to restrict accounts and stuff like that. Um, and now that more companies are doing transparency reports, it's really interesting to see the trends of like which governments are asking for data. How are they doing? Is it through court orders? Is it through any other means? Um, and trying to get that information out to the public more, I think has been has been good because we've seen more interests from non-traditional tech companies. So usually we uh, people who do transparency reports would be like Facebook, Google, well, Google actually started in 2010, but like Facebook, Google, like the big tech giants. But over the last couple of years, and specifically this year, just in 2020, we've seen um, other uh, other companies start to feel the pressure to do reports as well. A good example is with Zoom. Um, earlier this year. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I think the FOIA, FOIA requests for data, to my knowledge, haven't been very helpful for that. But, um, but transparency reports, I think, are a good way to go because it's essentially like a way for companies to cover their, their butts um, and to say, well, if we gave any information, it's because the government forced us to, and here are the requests we got. And then it'll be up to the public um, to say, well, why are, why is like the US, for instance, um, asking for hundreds and hundreds of accounts to be taken down. Uh, so, yeah, but yeah, maybe, you know, maybe uh, FOIA is something that we could kind of look a bit more in, especially when it comes to trying to persuade lawmakers in the U.S. to take this seriously. But yeah, again, hopefully the, uh, the protests and more public attention right now will push them more towards that needle. And actually, I figured this is a good time for, yeah, before I get to the next part that we can stop and have a conversation here, questions, comments, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think I can uh, follow up with Alex in the uh, giving you possibly a non-softball question. <laughs> we uh, we like rigorous debate at our meetups here. So, um, so my question for you is, speaking of the U.S.'s tradition of, you know, constitutional case law when it comes to thinking about privacy in this country, a framework that has been used for a long time is sort of the reasonable expectation of privacy that, you know, anytime we're trying in this country to decide whether something's a violation of our privacy or not, it's like, well, did they have a reasonable expectation of being private or not? And especially in the public space, this has usually been interpreted as, well, you don't have a right to privacy or an, ex an expectation of privacy when you're out in public. Um, and I'm curious if you think that the realities and the scale of facial recognition technology is, is really going to force us to revisit the legal justifications we're using when we're thinking about privacy. Like, you know, mm -hmm. one could easily, somebody who puts a bunch of facial recognition in public spaces that law enforcement and city officials have access to these systems, you know, one could easily, if you want to get mad at it, you could easily see the counter argument you get being, oh, well, you're out in public. You had no reasonable expectation of privacy. Like, I think I think you'd agree, like, we're going to probably need to build some new legal arguments and tools to push back against this because the old one doesn't really seem to work with this technology anymore. 
That's why, honestly, the first step is for the U.S. to have a comprehensive data protection law. Because the idea of what privacy is under the reasonable expectation of privacy is a totally different thing. Um, like, yes, as someone could recognize you, but the fact that you could be traced across, you could go across the country and be traced, um, even even in even in um, even in what should be technically private spaces. So you're walking down, um, you're, you're walking down the you're walking down the streets like on your block. Do you have an expectation of privacy there? But then there are people with their Amazon Ring, adorable uh, cameras that can capture your face. So I think that there's, the, the internet has really changed the game on sort of the, some of the traditional uh, legal arguments and reasoning that we used to understand things like privacy and free expression, um, because the potential for harm here is something that I think we just didn't even anticipate uh, when we were initially thinking about what privacy is. So yeah, no, I, was, I, I, I totally agree that I don't think that that reasonable expectation of privacy arguments is going to do much here because you should just because you you shouldn't expect um, the same amount of privacy inside your house as you would if you're out in a protest doesn't mean that you um, should be exposed to the sort of privacy implications of things like facial recognition because keep in mind it's not just like someone recognizing you but information about who you are being stored by a government agency by a company. Um, and especially when it's being stored by companies, like what are they doing with that information? So when you, when when it gets compromised in some way, this is it's literally your face. It's like it's your identity. You can't you can't get a new one. You can't get like a like you can't get a new driver. Not, not yet, anyway. Biotech's yeah. not that advanced yet. <laughs> not yet, exactly. So until the time comes when you can get a new face, um, this information that's being collected is not just. It, it's the most, I think sensitive isn't even strong enough a word, but information about who you are, um, I think just really undercuts what we initially thought privacy looks like. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts on this. If you think that there are any other sort of legal frameworks that we could use to understand this level of privacy. And before I hand it off to other people, I. I... One more. Well, if, if Alex was about to say something, I can't tell. There's so weird to tell feedback. Um, I had one more question for you before I try to pick the room and get some other questions for you. Um, so another thing I hear very often when I try to have this conversation debate with people and get people who aren't taking this seriously yet on the fight about what a big deal this is, this technology. I will often, you know, kind of get from certain individuals of sort of maybe the like, you know, think they're very clever, but also kind of cynical persuasion. They're like, well, the cat's already out of the bag on this. There's nothing we can do about it. Like, you know, they'll point to the fact, as you, you alluded to something like Clearview AI earlier, they'll say like, look, we live in a world now where there are apps and databases and systems where any citizen can now have an app that they aim at any random person on the street. And now it's not just the NSA who knows who that person is. Everyone knows who that person is, and that's just how it is, and we're all just going to have to adapt. What do you say to that person? It is, first of all, how dare you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree, but... <laughs> Ooh, uh, office reference there, but also, like, just because this is the world we live in doesn't mean this is the world we should be living in. And keep in mind that this is just here in the U.S. So the same companies, um, whether it's Microsoft's, Amazon, Facebook that operate here operates in other parts of the world, and where they have to, where they have to adhere to stricter uh, regulation and legislation, they do it. So if they can do it in Europe, why can't they do it here? And um, again, the TikTok example of having like a bazillion different privacy policies based on what region you're in shows that the companies will try to get away with as much as they can, and it's up to us not to let them do so. Uh, so yeah, again, just because Clearview exists doesn't mean that they should. Um, and just because, uh, yeah, and, and just because we we're already seeing ourselves in in a time where basically anyone can be the holder of that kind of information doesn't mean that that's how it should be. Um, there are ways to rein this in, and even on even on the on the company side, um, I mentioned investors earlier that investors are taking this seriously. So if investors continue to ask companies like Amazon and Microsoft to rein back this technology, I'm really confident that they will. So when, when, when groups like that with a lot of clout and power care, uh, I think we should be quite hopeful that they can that it can be changed rather than just 
sort of rolling over and letting that happen because um, it doesn't have to be. I agree. All right, now I'm going to start uh, asking the room if they have any questions. And if nobody but besides me and Alex chimes in, those of you I know I may put on the spot, but hopefully some of you will take the hint and ask a question. I actually have a question. Um, so so I, I've been having a hard time trying to frame it, but regarding, I guess, where facial, like the, the data that's the result of visual recognition surveillance. Do you, would you have any information on, I guess, is there a common entity that's storing that data? Is it stored by the people that collect it? Are people going to uh, a specific like data center to store specifically uh, facial, facial, facial recognition data or how does that work? Yeah, that's a great question and a big part of the reason we're so frustrated because we don't have a lot of the answers to that. Um, oftentimes, the technologies and the companies that are uh, that are creating them are super opaque about what their practices are for storing data, for keeping it safe, and things like that. So there's no, like, generally, it would be, uh, so if, um, if a, let's say, like, for instance, um, Amazon's recognition is being used by the police department, so presumably it would be the police that have access to that data wherever it's being stored, which they won't tell us. Um, but there, but also like probably Amazon does in some way, shape, or form. Um, we just don't know the extent to what the what those agreements look like and what the practice the real world practices of how information is stored um, also looks like. And for for law enforcement use, that's really bad, but also for commercial use as well. So if you go to Target and Target has a facial recognition uh, system that they're using to you know prevent shoplifting. Who holds that information? Is it targets? Like they have to. So do they just create their own database of um, essentially like a blacklist of people who shouldn't be allowed in, and then cross check it, uh, or are they cooperating with law enforcement? And we find that again, even for uses where it's supposed to be just within one box or just purely a commercial use, that there oftentimes will be overlap with uh, police use as well. So there's just a lot of questions about how this information is stored and where. Um, which is a big part of the frustration. So if you could take a wild guess based on that, I guess a wild guess if you're using knowledge that you have, <laughs> using the knowledge that you have, yeah. would you say that it's more probable that they are basically enlisting someone else to do this service? Do you think it's more probable that a lot of these companies actually have their own like shelf company some what's well, it's their company but on paper it's some shelf company that's actually owned by them that's holding the data yeah in both um there are examples of companies that um will so 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 some companies uh, will just provide like just a straight up tool like here's the the fish recognition tool to the customer to the client use it as you see fit and then we're totally separate from that process um, but then there are other companies that will provide, along with a tool, a, they'll help you build your own database. So if they're doing that, like they also have um, access to that. Um, but then the ones that might try to, but yeah, it's also possible that they'll try to um, uh, distance themselves from the tool, from the tool itself by having yeah, shell companies or different levels of companies that hold that information. Um, and yeah, it's just another thing that. We don't know, and uh, I was going to talk later about some of the avenues that we've been using, um, that we and our partners have been using around the world to fight rec facial recognition. And one of them is just one thing from civil society that we want is just to be able to map how this technology is being used, um, because there are lots of things that we don't know. We usually find out when something really terrible happens uh, that this that facial recognition has been used there. So um, there are some efforts uh, being made um, around the world to just map how facial recognition is being used in different regions, um, as well as like litigation. So Alex was talking about FOIA earlier. Um, in one of my colleagues uh, based in Argentina, uh, they have used kind of the court system to try to get a bit more information about some companies using facial recognition in Argentina. Um, and they're essentially just uh, bringing a case to court, asking the judge to force this company to like First of all, I uh, admit that they've been using facial recognition and unsealed the records around it. Uh, so there are different ways we have hopefully of getting that information, litigation, um, through just trying to map based on the reports that we have, 
uh, yeah, those are some other ways. Great. Uh, who else wants to be in the spotlight? Anyone? Hey, Tal, not to put you on the spot, but you <laughs> usually have cool questions. If you're there. Yeah. Um, I guess the only the only area I'm thinking about is more of like what's going on internationally. I it sounds like you know the situation in the U.S. is at a uh, you know stalling point right now, and the uh, the conversation about it is kind of held up by um, uh, the administration and different different situations. But um, what's working overseas? Like what what in the conversation? Like what argument points are resonating with, say, Europeans or, um, you know, any other peoples that are, any other countries that are starting to support the, you know, privacy legislation? Yeah. Uh, so what's working? Um, I'll say for our Latin America partners, it seems like litigation. Latin America and uh, some parts of Asia, that litigation is a growing uh, means that they have of doing this. So I mentioned the case in Argentina. Uh, we were also involved in the case in Brazil uh, where we intervened um, in a court case there that had to do with a an emotion. It was like emotion and gender detection tool, which is just super problematic. So for so there, it, we were able to make um, arguments kind of based in international human rights law of right to non-discrimination and so forth for emotion recognition and for gender recognition. First, we we're forcing people into into a binary, um, uh, and then secondly, beyond that, like, how can you how can you test someone's gender? Uh, so yeah, so that's been um, litigation seems to be the popular avenue uh, in Latin America and other parts of the world, frankly, where the government isn't necessarily um, where the government isn't necessarily going to like be on your side and to be supportive of civil society. So the courts have been one way. Um, whereas in Europe, we see more government engagement. So um, all of our European partners are doing uh, consultations and advocacy and lobbying with uh, politicians there. Um, and there's there, there are talks of a mandatory human rights due diligence legislation that may be passed in the EU, which would have implications for this as well. So um, companies that are providing facial recognition technology would have to do a human rights um, impact assessment on 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 the impacts uh, that this technology has on different communities and stuff. So that's right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to clarify part of my question uh, that I was interested in was the the public argument. I, I'm hearing uh, tactics yeah. that are working, which uh, is consistent with what you've been talking about. But I don't think I've heard much about just the messaging and what's what's responding messaging wise uh, overseas. Yeah, so I'd say that for Europe, it's very much it's just grounded in a lot of the privacy um regulation that already exists there that this is um and that this is an infringement on the right to privacy um guaranteed under the gdpr and and also under like other european law so the privacy argument is very much working there um in other parts of the world especially where litigation is concerned um it seems like there it's like so for instance in india and i think in kenya they have um other kinds of biometric data collection and ID that's tied to uh, social services, receiving social services. So there, the argument that seems to be working based on some, again, court cases is, um, you know, rights to access to, uh, to services being infringed by this very invasive technology. Uh, so yeah, I would say like for Europe, it's generally privacy. Um, other parts of the world, it's, um, more right to non-discrimination and an access to public spaces and to services that seems to be a good messaging for the us i'm not sure how we could package that thank you do we have anybody else who would like to ask a question here or shall we let is do a move on to the next part of her discussion yeah, I can move on because the next part is just pretty short, just that uh, talking about responsibilities for companies and for governments. Um, 
on what they should deal with. So uh, when we're talking to governments, things that we want them to consider are just a ban, a total ban of use of, uh, especially of government use of facial recognition, um, or to find less invasive ways of achieving the goal. So oftentimes these technologies we use because there's some goal like improving efficiency, whether it's in policing um, or in or in governments where it's being tied to uh, the provision of social services and welfare services as a way to um, yeah, to ensure that the people receiving services are who they say they are and things like that. So um, there we're encouraging governments to find a less invasive means of achieving those ends, whatever the ends may be. Um, and, and then just um, implementing strict limitations on how, uh, even under commercial use, this technology is being used. Um, and then specifically for the US context is having a data protection law. It's like a good place to start. Uh, and then for companies, um, and also for governments as well, is the human rights impact assessment. So I just said a moment ago that in Europe, they are probably fairly close to um, a mandatory human rights due diligence uh, legislation, which we haven't really seen uh, something like that elsewhere. So that would be really, uh, that would be a really impactful way um, to make companies and governments understand how this technology is affecting you know, people's daily lives. Um, transparency uh, in their in their contracts in their algorithms from companies it would be really really helpful for us to understand some of the questions that I think it was David was asking earlier um, about where data is stored, how it's stored, and things like that that will again help us like protect our rights to privacy. Um, and then finally, the, it's just understanding that there are some uses of this technology that are just not acceptable. So you could have all the safeguards in the world um, and things like mass surveillance would still not be an acceptable use of facial recognition. So yeah, so it's just sort of like creating those, that, that messaging to understand what part of this technology are we comfortable being, being used? And if there is a part, what safeguards can we put in place to ensure that people's rights aren't violated? Um, and then what parts of this technology are just not even like worth implementing safeguards, but should be just totally banned instead. Um, yeah, so that's where, we, that's where we kind of are now. I, I would have a quick little interjection there. Uh, maybe I'm, I now find myself curious, what do you find maybe would be the acceptable uses of this technology? And it's fine if the answer is none, but uh, I'm just curious what you personally, when you talk about us trying to figure out the yeah. spaces where it might be okay versus it's not, do you have any personal thoughts of like a rubric that we can use when trying to solve that admittedly very difficult question? Yeah, so I mean, there are things like if you have an iPhone and you're unlocking your phone uh, with your with face ID, which I think is what it's what they call it, which is probably a much more benign use. Uh, excuse me, and I mentioned earlier the example of uh, the Facebook tool that helps um, people with disabilities access some of face, uh, Facebook's services. Um, as well as things that will pre that will prevent fraud. I think the creative book also has, um, or at least we're piloting a tool that would alert you if your face had been uploaded by another user and as a way to prevent like, spoof or fr uh, fraudulent accounts. So there are some of those uses um, that are probably more acceptable, but the, again, they would need strict uh, limitations and safeguards around how they're, how they're being used. Um, where that information is stored and just yeah, more transparency to users, but where that information is being stored and how it's being stored um, and ways of getting consent. Um, and I think the consent piece is probably the thing that will uh, trip up most of those uses, even if they are benign, um, because the, whoever is making the tool, like they can, whoever, whoever is using the tool can provide consent, but oftentimes there are people who are impacted by um, fish recognition that are not the users of facial recognition. So how do you get consent from people like go into a process? Like, do you consent to having your face um, uh, being what to the process? Like so it's just not possible to get consent under that uh, under that scenario. So yeah, I, I think that there are probably some, uh, but when we start talking about things like consent and and uh, uh, and safeguards that it might show that there are just not very many of those uses that would actually be acceptable. That's the end of the stuff I prepared, so more questions are welcome. So go ahead, Kevin. 
Oh, and you said something that made me think of another question, which is, and even as far as people who want to uh, who want to push facial recognition as like you know an easy way to prove identity, you know, like in a world where we're seeing the exponential improvement in fake image generation technology in a world of starting of deep fakes that are starting to look completely real. I mean, that just strikes me as that tech right there is eventually going to completely break any use of facial recognition as a key to prove your identity or something. So I'm just curious your thoughts about like, you know, we often talk about the weaknesses of a biometric locks anyway that, you know, you alluded to it earlier that you can't change your face and if it gets stolen, it's stolen. Like, and I guess this is all a segue of me just kind of going to that are making what seem like obvious arguments like that of why this technology isn't going to work in most of these cases to people like us like is this to you like a winning argument to make to the people who are pushing this stuff anyway because i'm not sure if like they aren't getting these massive flaws in these systems or they get it and they just don't care yeah it's probably a little bit of both i'll say like so there was this guy from a company who was um on a call with a bunch of us civil society people and we were basically peppering him with all our questions about facial recognition and how his company could do this and he was like well for instance um when i when i went to the airport the other day uh i i travel all the time so i have this like global entry whatever um and there's this facial recognition tool that can recognize my face so i'm not using my passport or anything and i'll be fine um but then one day this thing wasn't working well and couldn't recognize my face. And this guy is like a white man and he's like, you couldn't recognize my face. Um, so uh, I so basically I understand that there could be problems with that. And as someone rightly pointed out, like you are a privileged person that has like 10 different forms of ID. So the fact that this tool couldn't recognize your face didn't keep you from entering the country. It just meant that you had to go through the line with you know, the other poor people um, to show your ID. So I think just trying to make it clear to these companies and people who are using this technology that it's not just like the real, I think sometimes you just really don't understand the implications that it could have for people for already like marginalized and at risk people. So if your entire livelihood and whether or not you will get food depends on this tool being able to recognize who you are accurately and you're a person of color um, and the, and, and the rate for misidentification goes up, like it doesn't, there, there's really nothing else that you can do. So, um, yeah, so it's, and to the issue of with uh, deep fakes and other ways of kind of spoofing this, I think that in response, actually, we've seen facial recognition improve to such a degree that there were um, reports of protesters in Hong Kong, I believe, who were at first wearing masks and uh, as a way to sort of trick the facial recognition systems. And that worked for a while, but now not so much anymore. When you have things like gates recognition um, included along with facial recognition. So it seems like the answer from the company side is just to make this as accurate and like as good as possible, um, rather than what, looking at what the actual risks are. So one thing we're honestly trying to do is to push for these companies before you roll out something like talk to the actual affected communities to understand what the impacts are for them and um, not just what you think the risks will be but what the actual um impacts are and hopefully that will help uh you know help um, some of these policymakers and um tool makers see that it's not just an issue of like okay well this didn't work well then you get you have another option right you have another option if this tool isn't working well for you but that this could really be it and could affect in, in strong ways. Yeah, it sounds like a very similar line of reasoning to the people who with voting access are like, oh, well, you have this other form of ID, you'll be fine. And, and I mean, also just to give a personal anecdote to your, your uh, privileged white man and his flying situation, I also as a privileged white man have a flying story where, uh, you know, I was flying to France and uh, they wanted to verify my identity with a facial recognition system on Air France. And, and I was like, well, surely I can identify myself in some other means. I mean, I have my passport right here. And I was basically told uh, the only acceptable form of identification is your face and you will submit to that or you will not be flying on this plane. So you, you talk about consent <laughs> and I'm like, they are increasingly not giving anybody <laughs> consent on this stuff. <laughs> But see, the, but the difference I think is that where that 
how long ago did that happen? Because if that it happened about a year ago, about a year ago. Okay, so while the GDPR was in force, so you could probably like challenge that. You could probably challenge that and win and have a real chance of winning in Europe. In the U.S., you see, it's weird. well, yeah, and I mean, admittedly, from everything I knew, uh, given who I am and and what I'd read with EFF's research on refusing these systems at airports, I was actually pretty confident that if I'd really wanted to make a stink, I could have said Air France was wrong and had to accept my passport as identification. But it's like, well, by the time I do that, I've missed my flight, you know. So it's like, you know, I really don't have a choice in the moment, even if legally I do have a right. <laughs> That's enough of meaningful consent again. How can you meaningfully get consent from someone when uh, this is the only option that they have? Is yes. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I stuck my face in the system and went like, well, probably some system already has it, you know, and had to just resign myself to that. Yeah. Um, what was that? There was one other thing I wanted to ask you. Um, yeah, one other question I'll ask you before I try to cajole questions out of other people. Um, which is sort of getting back to like effective arguing tactics on trying to get people to understand this. I find you know that you 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 find a lot of times the people who seem most in favor of this technology are citizens who very much for whatever reason and I I try not to you know judge anybody's individual reasons or, or emotional reactions but you know, there's certain citizens who, for whatever reason, facial recognition technology gives them a feeling of safety that, like, that this tech is going to make things safer. Bad people are not going to be in places. They'll get caught. Blah 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 blah. And then the other people who tend to be in support are politicians cynically exploiting these fears to gain power for their side, their team, their whatever. And I, I just like a lot of times. You know, and once again, this is one of those things that seems obvious to me, but I'm curious your thoughts about persuading people where I, I'm just like, but yeah, this tool may make you feel safe right now because your team's in charge. But once other people are in charge, you've just handed them a, the very powerful weapon you were just using on the people you don't like is now going to get used on you. And to me, it just seems so obvious why you wouldn't want to like take that risk. But it seems a lot of people are like, whatever, I'm winning right now. And I just wonder how we can break out of this tribal mindset and get people to understand, no, this goes beyond winning your little battle right now. This is about protecting all sides in the future. I, I think, yeah, I mean, that's probably the best thing you can do. Uh, actually, one example that comes to mind is I read this article in New York Times uh, about a month or two ago about this guy in San Francisco, this really rich guy who was like, I'm to solve the problem of homelessness and crime in San Francisco by um, putting facial recognition all over the city so that we can catch when people are um, not where they're supposed to be. So it just, <laughs> um, it's difficult in those, in those instances to say like, well, who's not supposed to be here? Um, what, what, is, what does a person who's not supposed to be here look like? Um, so, so beyond beyond that and the issues of discrimination that can arise, I think that one thing that should give everyone pause is who is who is the one making the decision. So you might live in a neighborhood where there's fresh recognition and you feel safe, but at the end of the day, like that means that you yourself are also subject to it, right? So it's not just the people you don't want that have to go through the system, but you as well. And are you comfortable with the fact that in you know this specific example, it's one like random billionaire that has all this information about everyone. So I think for me, it's just like I, trying to make people understand the different levels of trust that you have to have to believe that this is a good idea and like the best thing when it comes to your safety. So you're trusting that the institution um, that is collecting and holding this information is there for you. Um, you're trusting that um, that if something goes wrong, that whatever uh, law enforcement is, or whatever will be on your side. Um, and when it becomes, and, and again, I think it goes back to our comfort with giving our personal information to companies. The fact that there could be a company that has information about your face, you know, when you're leaving your house, when you're coming back, who you're coming with, how often you're going out. And because it makes you feel safer, like you're okay with that. So I just, I don't know, I, maybe I don't have a good answer to this, but it just seems right off the bat that things like 
understanding that it's not just other people who are subject to this, but you yourself, that you're also subject to it should give people pause. And then also at the end of the day, like, do you want some just one random rich guy to be the one that <laughs> that's in charge of your safety um, and just trust that he will always be benevolent and do things the, the way that you like? Because that's essentially what it comes down to. You're just trusting if you believe that, especially for safety, that this is that you know, this is the best way to keep your neighborhood safe, to keep your house safe, then you're trusting that whoever it is that's holding that information is the best person that should, that should have that and that it's totally cool that they get to have all this information on you. But one of rich billionaires ever done anything shady. Why would I not trust them? You have a really good point. I don't know. Just, this weird thing in my mind that's like Jeff Bezos is buying an 80 or more million dollar apartments in New York City when his employees are suffering during COVID. I don't know, just stuff like, right, exactly. So I think it's just, there are a lot of deep-seated reasons, but um, I'm really hopeful that as we're seeing uh, change on the local level, um, that's frankly probably more important right now, knowing that things on a federal level might not move, but knowing that um, throughout local levels and state levels that People are mobilizing, like you guys are mobilizing there in Austin um, in different parts of the country, and that laws are actually getting passed is really encouraging. Now, I, I continue to remain hopeful just because, much like with privacy, it does seem that you actually can find people on both sides of the political spectrum right. who uh, do seem to get this as a serious problem and that there needs to be some reform. Although not not to engage in too much uh, both sides dism because I'm like, well, why does it seem every time I learn about a new creepy facial recognition startup, I always find out the founders have ties to the alt-right inevitably. I've yet to find the founders who had ties to Antifa yet, though I suppose it may happen at some point. <laughs> There's always hope. That's when we'll know we live in a perfect world. When I know everybody's equally terrible. <laughs> hey, I, said, uh, um, yeah. I, I guess this is a clarification question. Um, so I know that um, different types of data are worth different amounts of money. So, for example, people's medical data can be worth up to up to like ten dollars per person, whereas most data is like hundredths of a cent per person. I was wondering um, what the value of that medical information is on the black market. Like why, why is medical information useful on a black market? I mean, are they selling people ads for like kidney transplants? Like I can't understand what the, what the context of that difference in value is and maybe I'll understanding. See. Yeah. No, no, go ahead and finish your question. Uh, and maybe understanding like why the value is what it is might might help communicate to people what's important about privacy. You know, honestly, my my honest answer is that I don't I don't know why. I mean, I can guess. Uh, and knowing the way that the healthcare and pharmaceutical industry in the U.S. works, um, I can guess why it would be very useful to have. Um, that sort of personal health data on people, but I, I frankly don't know why it's such a such a huge difference. Um, I think that's an interesting thing to watch right now uh, with the Google Fitbits merger that's trying to happen. Um, at least on the EU side, they're trying really hard to block um, Google from acquiring Fitbits, which makes perfect sense, right? Like, why should a company that already knows where you are at every moment of the day, what you're searching for? also know what your heart rate is, um, what your sex life is like, like all those other personal information of, or personal health information. Um, so for me, it's not so much, I, I think the question of like how much is worth is interesting, but also when it's one company holding, not just your name and email address, but your health data, your um, shopping habits, like all this other information about you, you start to see the incredible value of just having this perfect picture of who you are as a person um, and not just a picture of who you are but also um ideas of what predict yeah predictions of what you want and what you will be doing um i think it's where the value really comes from uh, especially when it comes to like advertising and stuff is right that's an entire point of collecting the data is to predict what you want and and to give it to you um for a cost of course but yeah no i I frankly don't know why it's specifically worth so much more. Um, and on the question of how of like, speaking and 
trying to find convincing arguments for policymakers, for other, even just like other um, lay people. I'm, I'm interested to hear what people's thoughts are on that, and if there are any methods or argument that you think would be particularly convincing to like people that you know, or even to you yourself. Well, not once again to put anyone on the spot, but I actually believe I was just chatting with Rachel here on Twitter who asked us a great question about some activism we could do around this here in Austin. But uh, Rachel, if you have uh, any uh, questions or thoughts do, we'd love to hear from you. It's fine if not, but I just figured I would follow up. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I saw you unmute, but I didn't hear you. Oh, well, um, I'm happy to continue the conversation with you. I think that was a great point you made on Twitter. Um, maybe I can uh, forward along the conversation a little bit uh, just so that I can hear your thoughts. Um, but uh, Rachel raised the thought about that specifically with um, you know facial recognition uh, often being used more in communities of color. Uh, she was sort of curious about your thoughts maybe about monitoring the usage of facial recognition and maybe it being a viable way to detect uh, racial profiling. For instance, if you could show that 80% of a police department's use of the software came from a, a minority majority zip codes or something like that and just your, uh, yeah, she just said her mic isn't working, but um, so I'm forwarding along. But yeah, like, you know, the thought of maybe using the disparities in zip code usage rates of the technology to make cases of police departments engaged in racial profiling. Yeah, I think that some of that information is already available and that research is already done because there was recently a letter from a bunch of House Democrats to the, the Democratic leadership um, basically raising that point that it's that there, there are already uh, reports and research showing um, that in communities of color is where these uh, technologies are likely to be used. So yeah, so I think I think that's it's a it's a good point, Rachel. You can take that a step further, um, and to show the explicit ties between, um, uh, between kind of like racism and racial injustice and the way the technology is being used. Um, like we discussed earlier, even if this is a hundred percent accurate, just by virtue of the fact that you're more likely to use a police department is more likely to use facial recognition in a dangerous area, and a dangerous area would be more likely to be Brooklyn than the Upper East Side, according to them, um, already shows that there are some underlying um, racial inequities going on there. So I think it could be used to make that much more explicit, um, but there are already ways that are, that are showing that, and apparently some lawmakers are uh, taking note of that and raising the issue. Do you know offhand of any ways to get that potential by zip code usage data? Because I know one thing that's been very infuriating for me in our fight here in Austin for reform is the the our transparency laws around what APD reports on this stuff are are like laughably bad. Where like they are by law required to publicly reveal their budget and everything they bought, but they're allowed to itemize things around hilariously vague, non-descriptive terms. Like they can just say fifteen thousand on computer software and not actually what the software <laughs> is. And and in fact the. I just recently got some additional information about what's going on here in Austin because another local nonprofit here in Austin called Grassroots Leadership just came out with a report where they'd been doing some research and some kind of investigative reporting, and they broke down some known uses of facial recognition technology and other surveillance software that um, our police department has apparently been using. But as I said, until I saw their report, I didn't know this, even though I follow this stuff, because the publicly available information is very hard to find. Yeah. Uh, actually, in New York City, um, we just recently passed the POST Act, which calls for um, civilian greater oversight and civilian civilian oversight of police use of surveillance technologies. Um, that was a law that had been, you know, languishing away in the depths of the halls of Albany for years and years. And then all of a sudden, um, after the protests in June, it passed like in the blink of an eye and was signed. Uh, so that's one way. And that so that law is like pretty specific on what kinds on surveillance technologies. So not just like you know the sort of general um, vague reporting that um, departments can do. So I think that's one way is by pushing for laws and legislation that are more specific about what kinds of 
technologies police departments should be transparent about their use of. Um, and another way to get that information actually is through the companies providing these tools themselves. So with Clearview, uh, we ended up finding out a bunch of uh, of clients of Clearview just from just from reporting about Clearview. So a bunch of people who use Clearview um, Clearview software uh, and finding out that when they say that it's you know only certain groups or or um, agencies that use it, that's not actually the case. So um, I think actually going after the companies themselves, like finding getting some transparency from the companies about who they're selling to. Um, could be another way, uh, another way of doing this when the specifically police departments or the government authorities are less likely to divulge that information. Because there's really no asking for a client list. There's really no um, danger there being transparent about who you're selling to. If if these companies say that they're doing everything legally and above board, uh, so that could be one avenue. Is, yeah, going through the companies themselves. Gotcha. Um, do we got any more questions? We're starting to run toward the end of our time and we've heard reasonably well from the people with us. Um, is there anybody we have not heard from yet who would like to ask a question? Or anybody we have heard from that's fine for repeats. Or it's also fine if everybody's questioned out. Um, and I, I figure we would have had a few more people with us to ask a few more questions, but we unfortunately had all those technical difficulties. There were at least four or five people who could not get in, and I have emailed our contacts at Cat Factory so that we can hopefully sort this out by next month because we've always had a little trouble with the links, but it got really bad this time for some reason. I do not know what happened. Um, if any of you personally know somebody who was affected by, like they tried to get in and, and were not able to, please do let them know that we recorded this whole talk and it will be available on our YouTube channel. And that also anybody who has a question, I'm happy to forward it along uh, via email to Isdua and she can follow up with you and try to get you an answer at a later date, assuming she has the time, of course. Um, no, absolutely, I'd love to. As I said, our, um, I'd really love to hear more about what's going on uh, at the Austin level. Uh, like I said earlier, I think the local levels are doing more exciting things than on the federal levels. Um, and if there's any way that Access Now we can support any advocacy you're doing, um, would be happy to do so. Absolutely. I mean, um, probably the thing I keep most active with news is if you're on Facebook and you may not be because many people in our community aren't, we have a fairly active Facebook group that I would recommend joining that has a lot of news and information in this space. But we have other means, our, our Twitter, our mailing list, our website, our meetup, they're just updated much less frequently and as I have time and bandwidth to do so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we absolutely want to uh, keep you in the loop and in the discussion because this has been great. Um, also, I feel uh, I feel compelled to let you know that um, if you're interested in this stuff and want to be more involved in the New York area, there are some uh, EFA uh, member groups in the New York City area. Specifically, I don't know if you're familiar with a group called Cyper Collective, but you should seek them out if you find these topics interesting. I believe they meet at the New York or maybe the Brooklyn Public Library. I don't remember exactly which one. I'd have to ask them, but they're the kind of most prominent EFA member in that part of the country. Um, so I had promised to Sedwa a, um, a softball question. I want to keep my word. Um, how did you get involved in the, in the privacy space? Like what motivated you to get involved um, personally? Yeah, so I kind of got here through business and human rights. Um, after, as I spent my last year of law school uh, in Madrid, sort of studying more business law, and I'd already had a human rights background. Um, so I just knew that holding corporations accountable for human rights abuses was kind of one way, was what I wanted to do. Um, and it just sort of happened. Actually, I, I, I was looking for fellowships. Um, that would allow me to live abroad for a year and work abroad for a year and do business and human rights. And it happened that Access Now, um, in our Argentina office, they were looking for someone to do be, uh, business and human rights work. So that's how I ended up in, in naturally in the tech space. It was a bit sort of uh, accidentally, but it makes perfect sense um, because you can't talk about uh, digital rights and technology and human rights without talking about the companies. 
uh, that are the platforms that you use when you're online or provide you access to get online and stuff like that. So it's just, yeah, it sort of happened by accident, but I think it makes perfect sense um, if you care about corporate accountability uh, to focus on the tech sector. Yeah. Thanks for the softball question, Alex. Really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know our, it, actually, we, we, we've had meetups where, frankly, I would not have wanted to be the speaker. We can get very technically knowledgeable people on both tech and law, and it can definitely be a deer in the headlights. I always insist on civility, but I always warn our speakers, you may get asked some very technically challenging questions. <laughs> But I want to thank you so much, Sedgwa, for this. It's been it's been great and very informative. Um, do we have any final questions before I maybe let us go a little bit early? No. All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I'm going to reiterate one more time. Please sign our official recognition petition. If you want us to actually have any credibility when we go knocking on council's door, being able to say that like several hundred to several thousand of you agree with us will make this much, much easier. Um, so by all means, uh, spread the news and spread the word. Um, there's other groups who are involved in this fight too. You should check out some of the work that Austin Justice Coalition is doing. You should also check out what grassroots leadership is doing. They're both uh, involved with us in different intersecting ways in this fight. And, um, and you know, I feel positive that there seems to be an actual appetite for a lot, um, some real maybe transformative change in this country right now. And I look forward to that hopefully happening here in Austin as well. Um, and yes, um, Isedwa, you will definitely be hearing more from us, I'm sure. Um, in fact, I'm going to probably connect you via email after this with uh, Nash from EFF, who's running the About well, Face campaign. He, he, you do know Nash. Okay, great. But well, he wanted to attend tonight, and he totally forgot. And frankly, if he hadn't That's forgotten, right. he might have had the same technical difficulties like so many other people did. I but he wants to see your with... talk, so I'm going to share the link with him. I was on a panel with Nash at RightsCon like two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, it's wow. such a small world. Small, small yeah, world. I, I, yeah, no, I mean, I've, uh, I hung out with, me and Alex hung out with Nash last summer when we were at the EFA gathering in San Francisco. Actually, I should mention here uh, to this group and hopefully to others who will listen, I mentioned earlier that Access Now has a digital security helpline um, that might be helpful to people here. So it's a helpline that provides 24-7 free uh, technical assistance to activists, human rights defenders, NGOs, uh, and so forth. Um, from, yeah, things like, and then they also provide uh, trainings and, and clinics on how to have, like, safe online digital practices, um, and then also on assistance with uh, people working in sensitive areas or incentive topics. So if, yeah, if you have any of the sort of like, technical stuff, you can reach out to the Access Now helpline um, and provide free assistance to help you keep doing the good work that you guys are doing already. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Sedwa. I appreciate that. Very appreciate it, Sedwa. And um, yeah, want, a great talk. And uh, thank you all, everybody, for coming with uh, attending. And you know, I know the world's crazy right now, so we're truly thankful to each and every one of you who spend these with us monthly. And um, and also apologies to anybody who got hit with the technical stuff. I do not know what happened there. We will get it sorted out by next month. Um, so bear with us and thank you for the patience. We'll uh, we'll see you all then, and I'll hopefully see you this Sunday, Alex, uh, if you're free for the board meeting. Thank you. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Okay. Well, at the very least, send the board an email about uh, your FOIA stuff. Uh, I think that was your action item, according to right. Josh, with the notes he took. Will do. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, Sedwa. Thank you, everybody. We'll All see right. you soon. Bye, Sedwa. Bye. Good night. Good night.